Look alive. Not dead yet. This is a brief history of Vladimir Putin's rise to power. And I mean brief. Hey. 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 On the 7th of October, 1952, a baby boy was born. He would grow up to produce Jingle All the Way, Pixels, Mrs. Doubtfire, and the first three Harry Potter movies. That boy was Mark Radcliffe. Vladimir Putin was also born on that day, and we've never seen them in the same room together. Interesting. Here's Vladimir Putin's IMDb page. He's got more credits than slim pickings. Putin was born in what was then Leningrad, but is now St. Petersburg. Both his parents were 40 or 41. Vlad was the youngest of three children, but never met his two brothers, Albert and Victor, both born in the 30s. Albert died as an infant, Victor as a child sometime during the siege of Leningrad. Putin studied law at Leningrad University from 1970 to 1975, during which time he was obliged to join the Communist Party, of which he remained a member until it was outlawed in 1991. At university, he was taught by Anatoly Sobchak, who would later co-author the Constitution of the Russian Federation, and become the first democratically elected mayor of St. Petersburg, and be a key ally for Putin in the 90s. Fresh out of university, he was recruited into the Committee for State Security, better known as the KGB. His decade and a half long career is as murky as you would expect. Who knows what is real, what is propaganda, and what is a different type of propaganda. From 1984 to 1990, Putin was, at least mostly, officially stationed in East Germany. He may have had a hand in supplying weapons to the Red Army faction, also known as the Bader Meinhof Group. Klaus Zuchold, a member of the Stasi, the East German secret police, and later a defector to the West, claimed that at the same time, Putin was also the handler of neo-Nazi provocateur Rainer Sontag. Zuckold also claims that during his work with, or near Putin, Putin sought out technical information on hard-to-trace poisons. So, the background of the picture starts to be painted. A boy whose family was personally decimated, and whose country was nationally devastated by war, who spent his formative adult years learning how to sow chaos across the border. Shit. In 1990, Putin found himself back in Leningrad. He became an advisor to his old tutor and friend, Anatoly Sobchak, as Sobchak entered the political field and ran for mayor of that city. In 1991, the USSR crumbled proper, with an attempted coup by communist hardliners failing against reformist Mikhail Gorbachev. Putin has no noted involvement in the coup, and claims to have resigned from the KGB the day following the coup's start. That year, Sobchak won his mayoral bid for Leningrad, and with much effort, the city's name was changed to St. Petersburg. Highly concerned with cultural and sporting events, and really the interests of the rich rather than the poor, the actual running of the city was done by two of Sobchak's deputies, Vladimir Yakolev and Vladimir Putin. Another aide to Sobchak was Yuri Shutov. The two fell out, and Shutov wrote an expose called Heart of a Dog, 
also translated simply as a dog's heart, about St. Petersburg corruption. Stories are blurred, but it seems that after this, later in 1991, either an anti-organized crime plain-clothed police group, or some burglars, either or, broke into Shutov's apartment and nearly beat him to death. That order, some think, came from Putin. As aide to Sobchak, Putin quickly became embroiled in corruption scandals. He may, or may not, have had an advisory position to a local property company, later accused of laundering millions of dollars. A special committee in St. Petersburg tried to investigate whether Putin had signed off on a contract exchanging more than $100 million worth of raw materials for food that just never turned up. But that investigation was stopped by Sobchak. Putin elongated his political reach, becoming the first deputy chairman for the government of St. Petersburg in 1994, and becoming a key member of the somewhat short-lived political party Our Home Russia. In 1996, Sobchak narrowly lost mayoral re-election to his own deputy, Vladimir Yakolev. Putin, who had led Sobchak's re-election campaign, resigned his city positions and ultimately had bigger fish to fry in Moscow. He quickly found success there and held various positions in the Yeltsin government before becoming head of the Federal Security Service, the FSB, on the 25th of June, 1998. This, to me, is the most important part of Putin's rise to the presidency. The FSB was the successor agency of the KGB and was and is the most important intelligence service in the country. If you control that, if you know what you're doing, and if you know how to make allies in the right places, well, let me tell you more. Yuri Shutov, once colleague, now enemy of Sobchak, and by extension Putin, won a seat on the St. Petersburg Legislative Assembly in December 1998. That year, he became even more vocal about St. Petersburg corruption, accusing Putin of attaining his previous position as deputy to Sobchak by blackmailing him. In February of 1999, Shutov was stripped of parliamentary immunity and arrested on charges of murder. Then, on the 9th of August, 1999, Boris Yeltsin appointed Putin as one of three deputy prime ministers, declared Putin to be his choice successor for the presidency, then made Putin acting prime minister and publicly stated Putin should run for the presidency all in one day. That day, Yeltsin also sacked the entire Russian government. The Duma, the Russian lower house of parliament, was mostly made up of communist seats, and they declared this 100% lunacy. In the US, a National Security Council spokesmouth said, We work with Russian ministers based on policies, not personalities. We know Mr. Putin well. We've dealt with him on Kosovo, where he was constructive. I don't know, but none of that rings true. I don't think they really knew who Putin was at all. A week later, on the 16th of August, Putin became prime minister. But although his rise from obscurity was meteoric, it took place in an environment of chaos. The economy was in shambles, and Yeltsin, the president since 1991, was on his way out. He had already fired his entire cabinet four times. What I'm saying is that this sudden appearance of this Putin guy wasn't necessarily obviously sinister. But then, in November 1999, Yuri Shutov's case was found not proven, and he was released in the courtroom, only to be abducted 
minutes later, apparently by the special purpose mobile unit. Such overt arrests and abductions were not very unusual in Russia at the time. Yeltsin resigned on the 31st of December 1999, which meant that Vladimir Putin, by constitutional mandate, became the acting president. By this time, Yeltsin's approval ratings were unbelievably low. Some reports put it at 4%, others at 2%. He was not well. He suffered from alcoholism and in 1996 had a quintuple bypass. Maybe he had just had enough. Well, he resigned in his annual New Year's Eve speech, but he actually recorded that on or around the 29th of December, and he mentioned nothing about resigning then. At the end of the first recording, where his message was more or less, Happy New Year, don't mind if I do, he decided he didn't like the take, so said that they would do it again on the 31st. On the morning of the 31st, Yeltsin recorded his surprise I quit speech, and then the onlooking journalists and the TV crew were confined until after it aired. That day, Vladimir Putin's first presidential decree, before almost anyone knew that he was the acting president, gives a clue as to what really happened. It was titled, On Guarantees for the Former President of the Russian Federation and the Members of His Family. Yeltsin was facing massive corruption charges, and this let him off the hook. Without this resignation, elections wouldn't have occurred until June of 2000, but suddenly they had to happen in March. I can't prove that Yeltsin suddenly quit six months before his term was up anyway because Vladimir Putin had compromising information about him and offered him an easy way out, but that makes sense, doesn't it? Putin won the presidential election with 53% of the vote. Just before election day, the state television network ORT, controlled in part by Boris Berezovsky, then considered a Putin ally, went all out against Putin opponent Grigory Yavlinsky, although Yavlinsky received less than 6% of the votes, so it's difficult to say how effective media interference really was. Isn't it always? In September of 2000, the Moscow Times reported that the vote had been compromised. According to their investigation, Ballot boxes had been stuffed, voters had been intimidated, the spymaster wasted no time. Putin's consolidation had begun. And that's where we leave things for now. Did Vladimir Putin leverage himself into power? It certainly looks like it. Maybe next week I won't be doing the consolidation of Putin, but I will be doing that soon. Thanks for watching. These videos are available about a week early on Patreon for people who patronize me. It's meant to be a week. It's usually five or six days early because I'm pretty disorganized, but I try. Again, thanks for watching. Good luck. Do you like my sweater? My other three clothes are in the wash. I've had it for about 12 years. Bought it for about three pounds at Primark. It's doing alright. I bet the person who made it is almost an adult now. So. What a dark world. The radio will advise you what to do about taking the body away for burial. Heck, as I understand it. I don't like it at all, he says. It's not Russian.